Hello, and welcome to the beautiful Autumn Hills of Irving, Massachusetts. Today, we are out to visit the forgotten realm of a king, Irving Castle, the home of John Smith, a Scottish poet and actor who lived out here for 30 years among the trees and cliffs of the New England interior. And hey, although I'd be willing to bet today that most of you have never heard of the guy, you gotta trust me. When I tell you that back in the late 19th century, our friend John Smith was a real local celebrity. Every year, thousands of people would make the trek out to his castle, all hoping to hear him recite a poem or deliver a lecture, ask his advice, purchase his fine hand-woven clothing, or even just generally bask in the glow of a bona fide wise man. So of course, a man of that stature lived in a home worthy of the respect and admiration that he once commanded. And luckily for us, that home is still almost completely intact today. And now, after a long hike through the woods, we are almost right in front of the place. More than 120 years after John Smith last set foot in it, we're about to see the castle. So please, uh, take a deep breath, prepare yourself, and feast your eyes on Irving Castle. Yeah, here it is. This is it, Irving Castle. John Smith lived for over 30 years in a one room cave. You see, Smith oftentimes went by another name, a pseudonym really. Up in Irving Castle lived the Irving Hermit. <laughs> yeah, John Smith was an honest to goodness, salt of the earth, real as it gets, hermit. Living on the edge of society, detached from civilization. The Irving Castle moniker is just sort of like a fun little sarcastic joke name that people used to use for the place. But, you know, at the same time, Smith just really loved living up here. And to him, it might as well have been a castle, right? Oh, and all that stuff I told you about him being a real cultural centerpiece around here, that is all totally true. Like the fact that the guy lived in a cave didn't stop anyone from coming up here to seek his wisdom. Like, if anything, it just enhanced his aura, really. But hey, before we get too deep into the particulars of what John Smith got up to around here back in the day, let me, let me just back it up a bit and tell you a little bit about the man's backstory, or, or at least my best guess at his backstory. You see, despite the fact that Smith wrote at least two separate autobiographies and that local journalists around here wrote literally dozens of articles about the guy back in the day, it can be a little hard to figure out exactly what the true story behind the Irving Hermit is. Because Smith spent decades as like a near mythic figure, right? So as you might expect, all sorts of different tales and legends about his life have made their way into the pages of history at one point or another. So it can be tough to separate fact from fiction here. Like for example, Sometimes you might read that one of Smith's formative memories as a child was his mother putting his hands on his head, looking him in the eye and begging him not to become a soldier like his dad did. But then other times, Smith's mother died when he was just a baby. But that's kind of half the fun when it comes to characters like this, right? I mean, the myth and superstition that surrounds them is sometimes just as interesting as the facts. Besides, I was able to dig up, you know, enough stuff to paint what I think is at least a pretty accurate picture of Smith's time on this earth. So without any more dramatic buildup, let me tell you about John Smith, the hermit of Irving Castle. beautiful day. Let's get into this. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on Smith's early life, partially because I think it is far and away the muddiest part of his history, mostly because it's informed by Smith himself, like through his autobiographies. But also, I just think the real like 
juice in this story comes from Smith's time up in his cave. So I just want to burn through his early life real quick so we can get to the cool stuff. But still, there's some important stuff to know about his life back in Scotland. So let me just start with his birth. In 1823, in Perth, Scotland, John Smith is born. Kind of. Sort of. Because John Smith, that's not even the guy's real name. Like, it's just a fake name that he came up with one day. Nobody knows what real name he was given at birth. But regardless, the guy that we now know as John Smith was born in 1823. And maybe he knew his parents. Maybe not. But one thing we can be fairly sure of is that pretty early on in his life, John Smith was out mostly on his own, traveling through Scotland with a pack on his back, you know, working as a peddler, selling all sorts of stuff, jewelry, knives, dry goods, you name it. But it, it did not take Smith long to discover his true passion, acting. He just kind of fell into it one day, like almost by coincidence, right? <laughs> but according to Smith, he was a natural. Like he used to pack the house every night, eager crowds waiting to see him, like a true thespian this guy was. It seemed as if he had found his life's calling. But unfortunately, everything couldn't stay rosy for our friend John forever. As fate would have it, Smith ended up getting intertwined with a woman who would eventually break his heart. Now, this is another instance where the details are fuzzy, right? Like there's about a bajillion different accounts of who this woman was and how John met her. And like even the way that their relationship ended is always at least a little different. Like sometimes it's something simple, like maybe she ran off with another man while she was already committed to John. But then other times it's some big complicated story where John takes on a stage name for a certain play and then he invites his woman to see the play and she's reading the playbill and she sees his fake last name and that fake last name is the same as another woman's last name. So she assumes that Smith is like secretly already married and is trying to cheat with her and the particulars aren't important. Like the only thing that matters here is that while the story is always different, the one thing that doesn't change is that whenever John Smith spoke of how he loved and lost, tears inevitably always begin to well up in his eyes and roll down his face. Like clearly this was real heartbreak. Like John Smith carried this pain with him until the day he finally drew his last breath. And that heartbreak, that's also what kind of propelled him into life as a hermit, right? Like no longer feeling confident in his place in society, Smith just decided to withdraw and live in isolation, right? Like here, listen to the man himself explain it. This is a great quote. Despondency, like a dark cloud, now began to settle over me, leading me to renounce the world and seek retirement. And true to his word, Smith spent the next 20 years bouncing around Scotland as a true hermit, keeping mostly to himself, living in shacks and caves across Scotland. Until one day, John Smith got the idea in his head that maybe he should go try the United States on for size. You know, maybe it's time for a change of scenery. Maybe it's time to move. But I'm sure the question that's popping in your head right now is why, right? Like, I mean, why would he just randomly decide to, to make the journey across the Atlantic, pack up everything he's got and start a, start a new life on another continent, right? Well, <laughs> I swear to God, this is real. It is because he heard that there were better caves in the United States. Like, <laughs> isn't that just amazing? I mean, of course, John Smith sometimes gave different answers to that question depending on when he was asked, but this explanation is far and away my favorite one. Like, just the idea of making a weeks long journey to a brand new land just because somebody told you the caves in Massachusetts might be better than the cave you're living in right now. Like, <laughs> this is just the, you know, the kind of little detail that really makes a story sing, right? It's just, I love hearing about this kind of stuff. Anyway, though, after making it to the U.S., Smith spent time all over the Northeast, you know, New York, Boston, whatever, you name it. And he made money for himself mostly by selling things. You know, he's sort of going back to his roots as a traveling salesman. And although Smith sold a wide variety of items, his number one product was unquestionably wild berries that he would pick himself out in the woods. You know, he was almost sort of famous for that. Now, in one of his autobiographies, John actually makes a big deal out of his berry selling business. Like specifically, what he wants you to know is that 
profit margins on hand-picked berry sales are very thin. Like, look at this. In order to get his point across, Smith even included a little balance sheet for our reference. You know, a little chart to help simplify the complicated accounting that he's trying to convey here. So let's check this out. $5 in profit from selling the berries, a dollar in living expenses, and that's it, that's the whole chart. <laughs> now, even though it's funny to include a balance sheet with only two lines, the real important thing to take away from this chart and accompanying explanation is that John Smith was only making about four bucks for 10 days of work, which back then, even back then, wasn't really that much, especially if you're living mostly in cities and traveling a lot like he was. So as time passed, Smith just began spending more and more time out here in the countryside until one day while he was out on a chestnut picking expedition, he stumbled upon this cave in Irving, Massachusetts. And this cave, you know, it's, it's situated up on a hillside. There, there used to be a natural spring flowing out of a rock over there somewhere. And the cave's isolated, it's quiet. It's the perfect spot for a hermit, right? So Smith, you know, taking it as a sign that it was time to settle down, took up residency. And boom, 1867, Irving Castle is founded. And for the next three years or so, Smith kept mostly to himself up here. You know, he lived off the land. And, and then sometimes when he did have to go into town, he would kind of creep through the woods, right? Rather than take the road. And he would make sure to never go to the same store twice in a short period of time. Like the guy just really did not want to be found. He really did not want to be recognized, really did not want to be kicked out of his cave. But unfortunately for him, it was just out of his hands. On a fateful day, in 1870, while Smith was hammering up some boards to serve as like a windbreak for his, for his house, another human called out to him, a voice, you know, something that he'd never heard before up at his cave. Hello, the voice called. And turning quickly, Smith just barely caught a glimpse of someone hightailing it back through the woods. But that was enough. John Smith knew he was discovered. And let me tell you, the thought of being discovered terrified John Smith. Like he spent the next few hours after that encounter just spiraling, worrying about being kicked out by the sheriff, about no longer being allowed in his little cave, about having to strike back out into the world, nowhere to sleep at night, winter's on the way, how's he gonna make a living? How's he gonna stay warm? What if men from the town come up and kick him out of the cave? What if what if they wanna kill him? What if they chop him to pieces with, a, with an ax? Like he was literally thinking that was gonna happen. So he's just scared, right? Like horrified. And his fear was not completely unfounded either because it came to a head the next day when three men walked up to his camp and up to his cave. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> one of the men in that little group of three was literally named Mr. Death. <laughs> but surprisingly, contrary to his name, Mr. Death and his friends actually seemed like pretty nice people, right? Like they explained that they were actually building a small road a ways away from the cave. And yesterday, one of them had just sort of like stumbled upon Smith's camp, right? Like that was the guy who Smith saw yesterday. So after hearing about this and realizing these guys weren't gonna <laughs> chop him to death with an ax, he invited them into his cave and they got to talking. And pretty soon Smith realized that he had nothing to fear from these guys. Like they made it very clear to him that nobody really cares if you live up here. Everyone in this community is nice. Like, don't worry at all. And then they just went on their way. And Smith thought that was the end of it. But then the next day, a few women from the town showed up and they brought with them some food and sweets as a sort of cave warming gift, right? It was almost like they considered Smith their new neighbor and they wanted him to feel welcome, right? But it didn't even stop there. Next day, more people came and brought in more things. And then the next day, more people came and the next and the next, more people, more people, more people. And all of a sudden, Smith has a constant stream of visitors on his hands. Like every day they're showing up, bringing him gifts. It's getting to the point now where Smith is starting to look around and scratch his head and wonder what the heck all these people are doing out here. Like, what are they getting out of this? But little did he know, <laughs> John Smith had unwittingly kicked off a microculture, like, a very small and now nearly forgotten blip of a movement in history. Like very soon, his cave would become the centerpiece of a completely unique atmosphere and community. You see, as more people started to stream on up to his home, 
Smith just started thinking that, you know, he's he's got to be a good host, right? Especially with all the stuff people are bringing him. So he just starts telling stories and reciting poems for his visitors, singing songs, talking about what it was like back in Scotland, you know, explaining what it felt like to live as a hermit, everything. He's basically putting on like real variety shows up here pretty much, right? And being an actor, as I'm sure you can guess, Smith had a real talent for this kind of performance. So word spread and the size of his audience just kept growing and growing. And eventually Smith started like selling stuff up at his house too, like almost opening a little market at the cave where he would sell pictures of himself, copies of his autobiography and these hand woven stockings that he would make himself up here in the hills, right? So now people are coming down off the mountain with with handmade souvenirs from the hermit. And so I'm sure, as I'm sure you can guess, this whole thing just kept snowballing and snowballing. And eventually he even had guest speakers showing up here, like preachers to deliver sermons to the crowd. And he even specified like a little rock next to the side of his cave as pulpit rock, you know, the official speaking platform for the clergyman. And as Smith's renown spread, so did his home too, right? Like it started as a cave and eventually he built a wooden shack, you know, just outside the cave, and garden terraces for growing crops, staircases cut into the stone, which you can still see today, and a small stove made out of rock and metal, and, and this is the best one. He even built and put in picnic tables for his audience to sit at. So now he's really leaning into this whole thing, right? Like, according to a bunch of newspaper articles I read about these events, it was not, it was not uncommon at all for literally hundreds of people to be up here at once. Like according to this article in 1873 alone, just one year, 10,000 unique visitors made the trek up to this cave. Like this place used to be absolutely a buzz with people, right? Like everywhere, all excited to see and hear the bonafide hermit that, that they had heard so much about. Like, isn't it just, it's just crazy to like look around this place and imagine a scene like that. Hundreds of people eating, shopping, talking, singing, dancing. John Smith basically had what sounded like daily festivals up here in the woods. Like just, that's just wild stuff. By the way, there's still uh, plenty of like relics left over evidence from uh, Smith's settlement up here. Like this uh, cellar hole foundation right here. There's also, of course, stone walls everywhere around here, but that's not really unique to the castle. You can find these all over New England. Check it out right here. Not really a staircase how you would think of it now, but these rocks are very clearly cut and placed deliberately. I also heard that Smith like expanded the cave himself. So I've been in here for a while trying to look for evidence of that. There's like a few things that look sort of like maybe drill holes like that or this but I don't really know enough about, about like rock blasting to tell for sure what's what. Some very intentionally placed retaining wall looking things right here too. See that stonework? A little too close to the cave for me to think it's part of the garden system, but maybe. I have a feeling that this jutting out right here is probably pulpit rock. Matches the description I found pretty, pretty well. Large flat rock sticking out next to the cave. Good view of the, the surrounding area. Ready to give a speech. And of course, there is just an absolute mountain of great little details and anecdotes that grew out of these hillside gatherings, right? So let me just rapid fire tell you like a billion real quick. So according to Smith's autobiography, he had like a near mastery over all the animals of the woods, right? Like he wrote that he was great friends with all the birds and rabbits and stuff. And apparently he even had a pet mouse named Frisky that he would get to climb up on his shoulder and do little somersaults to entertain his guests. Like just another part of the almost like carnival like aura that this place once held, right? And one time an 80 year old woman who considered herself a spirit medium came up to see the hermit. And as soon as she made it up to the castle, she just collapsed and fell into a trance, right? And the hermit saw that thinking that she had fainted. He ran off to get her a glass of water. And as the woman came back to consciousness and opened her eyes, the first thing she saw was John Smith running through the woods, water in hand, coming to save her long white hair and clothes billowing in the wind, blowing around him, right? So the old woman sees this 
this and she instantly decries Smith as some kind of super spirit medium and she starts asking him questions about old Egyptian kings and Joseph from the Bible as if Smith was some kind of like omnipotent angel or something, right? And all right, this is one of the weirdest ones. Like apparently one day some Confederate soldier like war criminal guy on the run from the government just showed up at the cave in the middle of the night and just started like roasting John Smith, like just screaming a bunch of insults at him. And, and then eventually he just got sick of doing that and wandered back out into the woods and Smith never saw him again. But Smith like started asking around trying to figure out who the heck this guy was. And he learned later that the soldier guy who was just standing there roasting him for no reason was literally being like actively chased through the woods by detectives at that exact moment, right? Like he paused in his escape to just berate Smith for a while. Oh, and at one point, the festivities up at the cave got so like massive and lively and reliable that a few guys approached John Smith about about opening a bar up on top of the mountain. But, you know, Smith, he was like devoutly anti-alcohol, so he shut him down real quick. But it's, that's even crazier to imagine, right? I'm sure that would have really kicked the, kicked the gatherings up into something real wild if they had a bar up here. One of the most common questions that Smith got while he was up here was whether he would ever consider marrying. And he always said that the woman that he had lost in Scotland was his one true love and that he was incapable of ever loving deeply again. Like his heart was just too scarred. He would even add on that he had some rich uncle back in Scotland that promised to leave Smith his fortune if and only if he could just find it within himself to, to get a wife. But alas, even a chance at untold riches couldn't repair John Smith's broken heart. Oh, and here's something kind of cool. Uh, for a short stint back in the 1870s, Smith was even convinced to take his little variety show on the road, right? Like delivering lectures through the Northeast at various churches and event centers, all at a booking price of 10 bucks a pop, which is good money for a hermit. Such titles for his lectures included Hermit Life in Europe and America. And when I was young, apparently it only cost 15 cents to see the speeches. Oh, and a lot of advertisements I saw for the events were very specific to say that oyster dinners would be served both before and after the speech. So either those were some real long speeches or everybody just really loved their oyster dinners. Oh, oh and here's my absolute favorite of all the little details and tidbits that I found surrounding the, the phenomenon of Irving Castle. So just in case you doubted how much of a community gathering space this, this place really was, they used to even hold events like high school reunions up here. You know, stuff that is just totally unrelated to the hermit. Like this was pretty much the equivalent to like an event center or a fairground that we might have today, right? Like a high school reunion, is that not just insane? Like imagine today, if you were tasked with planning a reunion for your school and one of your classmates was like, hmm, how about we hold this thing down at that homeless guy's cave by the river? <laughs> but back then, this place was such a big deal that that was just totally normal. Like this was, this was an institution pretty much. And hey, in case you're wondering about how the story finally ends, it's not with some kind of like big event or spectacle or anything like that. After 30 years up here, John Smith just eventually grew old and he died at the end of the 19th century. And that was it, right? Without its central figure, the gatherings up at the hillside just evaporated away. And now we've just got the cave, serving as an eternal monument to the, to the incredible man who once called it home. All right, so uh, before we hit the home stretch of this video, I just wanna pause real quick and show you uh, like a whole bunch of cool stuff. Cause after I got done filming my uh, narration at the castle, I just kind of drove around North Central Massachusetts for a while, checking out all the, the nearby libraries to see if uh, anybody had any good info on John Smith that I didn't know about before I went to film. And oh boy, did they. So let's take a peek. So the first thing I was able to find was at the Greenfield Public Library. They actually had a, a photo copy version of the 1871 autobiography that John Smith wrote himself and even though it's just a photocopy still very cool to you know read the words in person that John Smith once wrote look at that published for the benefit of the hermit 1871 in giving this book to the public as I do by request I feel called upon to express my thanks to those who have so kindly assisted me in my undertaking 
Feeling grateful to the public for former kindness, I am very respectfully John the Hermit. And then I went down to the Irving Public Library and they just had like a whole treasure trove worth of stuff. Like I, I asked the, the two women working the desk if they had any stuff on the Irving Hermit and they were like, oh, maybe and started clicking around on the system and everything. And then they were like, oh, maybe we got it down in like the, the local history room or something like that. And then they walked away and they came back and just handed me like four binders full of just absolute gold about John Smith. So huge thank you to those two librarians and huge thank you to the Irving Public library because we got a ton of cool stuff to look at right here all right so i'm at the irving massachusetts public library right now look at some of this cool stuff they got on john smith so first this book history of irving massachusetts great picture of john smith and another good one of him at his house isn't that cool whole chapter on the guy and then check this out look at how good this picture is of Smith out in front of his little cabin house thing look at him there man that is awesome how about this just this binder that says John Smith, a unique character. And then it's just a bunch of loose leaf paper <laughs> that somebody typed out and printed. And it has absolutely no mention whatsoever of who the author is. So if you're out there, thank you for writing this. There's a lot of good info in it. But far and away, the best thing here is this. Looks like somebody put this together 25 years ago-ish, 1997. And it's just a really great little summation of John Smith's life. And the best part is this timeline at the end here where he kind of just like mentions a whole bunch of, of stuff that the author was able to find in old newspapers and stuff. Like how uh, Apparently there used to be a baseball team in Irving called the Hermits in 1875. That's pretty good, isn't it? Here's something cool talking about how uh, the village brass band played music up at the Hermit's house. Isn't that cool? Like imagine sitting up in the woods up there on the grass listening to a brass band blast away while the Hermit looks out over from the top of his rock. And then coolest at all, coolest of all is all these great photographs in the back of the book. These are just awesome. I am so glad I came to this library. Last but not least, you guys might not believe this, but I actually got to meet the hermit himself too. Yeah, John Smith, he's still kicking around Irving. If you don't believe me, just uh, go there yourself and ask around and someone will probably point you in the right direction. Once you know where to look, it's not that hard to find. And hey, uh, if you're lucky, you might even get to meet his cat, too. Little Toby. By the way, uh, I think this just might be one of the most beautiful cemeteries I think I've ever been in. Before we go, I want to leave you with one last little detail. You see, whenever John Smith gave his lectures, he always took great care to dress specifically in red and black. Because according to John, there was a sort of like clothing code when it came to Scottish hermits, right? Like the colors you wore represented the type of hermit that you were, 
or where you came from or why you were a hermit, that type of thing. Like for example, a hermit wearing all black is a total recluse, completely detached from society. And then a hermit who wears black and white, he has always been a hermit. You know, he was born into the lifestyle. And then a hermit wearing John's colors, red and black. Now that is a hermit who has experienced an irreparable heartbreak. That poor guy, he just never got over it, right? No matter how long he lived and how many people came to see him, still hurt. Hey. Hey, uh, you ever uh, have those conversations with friends about like hypothetically going back in time to see like a band or movie right when it came out? You know, like the classic questions, like if you could go back in time to any year and see a band perform in their prime or be there on opening day for a movie, like what year would you want to go back to and who would you want to see or what would you want to see? And there's like a billion great answers, right? Like maybe you want to go back to 1969 and see Black Sabbath play in their heyday or maybe you want to be among the, the first crop of moviegoers to walk into a theater and see Star Wars for the first time. Maybe you're like super into Public Enemy and you, it's your dream to go see him in the late 80s, watch him walk out onto the stage. Maybe you wanna go watch the bullet scene in The Matrix for, with a whole bunch of people who'd never seen it before back in 1999. Like there's a, a million great choices, right? <laughs> but now that I'm sitting here and, and thinking, if you ask me, if I'm ever given that choice, then please, God, take me back to a cool autumn evening in 1878 and allow me to march and hike my way up through the cliffs and trees of Irving, Massachusetts. Uh, but permit me to, to catch a glimpse of Irving Castle as I approach the hollowed ground of the hermit. Let me sit down on a, on a hand-carved picnic table, kick my feet up in a pair of freshly purchased stockings, gaze upon the crowd of, of hundreds of faithful friends of the hermit, <laughs> enable me to hear the, the buzz and ring of the conversation and music around me. Don't stop me from, from melding into the crowd and slipping into that long lost community. And, and please, please let me witness that, that old hermit rise from the shadows of his cave, gaze down upon his visitors and, and bask in the, in the world that he has created, right? Like a community, a culture, an atmosphere, an aura that you that you cannot plan, right? That you cannot manufacture. Like this, this is the kind of thing that only emerges by accident, via, via a set of circum circumstances that cannot be recreated. Like no matter how long humanity exists, there will never, ever be anything like Irving Castle ever again. But even though the days of the gatherings up here are long gone. Their memory isn't. So thanks for watching. See you next time.